Tonight we're going to be talking about a very um, difficult and sensitive topic, something that bothers uh, many within the Jewish community, and that is the issue of missionaries. Now I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the same question over and over and over again, and that is, are missionaries still a problem? You see, for many Jews, if they don't have somebody knocking on their door, and they don't see somebody handing out tracts on the street, they assume that it's no longer a problem. And furthermore, when it comes to people's own immediate um, circle of friends, if they don't know somebody who is currently in there and causing a stir, then obviously it's not a problem. What happens is we, we tend to project our experience and generalize it out into the wider population. And so we assume if I haven't been accosted by a missionary, then really it's not a problem. And the presentation tonight um, is here to, number one, explain a little bit about um, the missionaries and their... Um, their passion and their obsession to go out and evangelize, not just the Jewish people, but the whole world, then to look specifically at why they do target the Jews in a special way, and then to speak a little bit about how things have shifted from the way missionaries have been doing things in the past to the way they're doing it today. So let's get started. Before we um, talk about before we talk about missionaries, it's important to, talk, to know who we're talking about. Because clearly not every Christian is out to convert Jews. You see, there are many Christian denominations who have no interest whatsoever in converting Jewish people. Now, for the sake of tonight's presentation, I've really uh, oversimplified things, and I've put things into small groups. So you have um, the orthodox group within the church. Um, that would be the Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, those groups, although in the past they were often at the forefront of converting Jewish people, but today for the most part there's no organized um, drive to go and reach out to Jewish people and convert them en masse. And so therefore we're not going to be talking about the Roman Catholic Church or all those Orthodox churches tonight. So what we're left with is the Protestant, um, the Protestant groups of Christians. And within the Protestant world, there are thousands of denominations. And clearly, not all Protestant uh, Christians are interested in converting Jewish people. The more liberal Protestant groups, like the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, they're not really interested in converting Jewish people. Um, they may not have such favorable views on Israel, but for the, for the part of converting Jewish people, they have no interest. And so what we're left with is really the evangelical right-wing Protestant groupings. Uh, sometimes they're called born-again Christians. Uh, sometimes they're known as the Pentecostals. Um, but how... Whatever it may be, these are the groups that are behind largely um, most of the efforts to convert Jewish people today. And we know there's about um, one in four um, Americans <coughs> identify as evangelical born again Christians, and their beliefs are something that really guide and inform the way they live their life. So they take the Bible very seriously. They take their salvation extremely seriously and to the point where they feel that not only are they in need of salvation, but the whole world is in need of salvation and therefore central to their beliefs is to go out and to spread the gospel, spread the good news of salvation and have as many people as possible um, saved from the eternal fires of hell. And so their, uh, I guess the heart of their message 
is based on a verse in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3, verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Which means that as far as they're concerned, every human being that was born is tainted with the original sin of Adam. And therefore, because of that, we are unable to enter into a relationship with God. And so therefore, we will spend eternity apart from God. Unless, unless we accept the provision that God gave in order to save us, which is the sacrifice of his only begotten son, which they consider to be Jesus. And so, as we'll see over here in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, which means that there is only one way that any human being can have a relationship with God, and that is by accepting the blood atonement of Jesus and accepting Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And so, from their perspective, they see the whole world split into two camps, into a camp of those who are lost and those who are saved. There are some people who will be experiencing paradise for eternity, and then you have the other group who will be spending eternity in hell. Now, I want to leave this image up here for a moment because I want you to understand that for born-again evangelical Christians, this is something that they feel as a great burden. This is something where they feel that their neighbors, their business associates, their friends, people who they come into contact with, who they love very dearly, are going to be spending an eternity in hell. And it's very difficult for them to live with, knowing that here's somebody who's going to be spending eternity in hell, and I could do something about it because I could share with them the gospel, I could share with them the good news, and I'm not sharing it with them. And they feel, therefore, compelled to go out and to share it with their friends. And sometimes it's with great risk to them, to their relationships, to their friendships, because they know that not every person is interested in hearing the gospel. And nevertheless, because this image is so real to them, they are um, inspired and they get over that uh, impediment, those, those fears, and they go out and try to convert not just Jewish people, but the entire world. However, it is not... Um, the entire world that we're concerned with tonight. We're more concerned about the Jewish people. And so we've all heard of a group named Jews for Jesus. Um, and Jews for Jesus is just one of hundreds of groups that have a focus of reaching out to Jewish people specifically and to bring them the message of the gospel. And the, the efforts that they've um, in, invested the time, the money, the energy, the manpower that they've invested is incredible. They have conferences every year internationally to discuss specifically Jewish evangelism. Next year, in August, there's going to be a special, um, a, a special conference that's going to be taking place here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And they're spending a full week, a full week from Sunday to Friday just to discuss how they can more effectively communicate the gospel to the Jewish people. That's what this is about. And in fact, I looked at the program. They have programs that are going to be speaking specifically about how to break through and infiltrate the Orthodox community because they're not happy with just reaching those that are unaffiliated. They want to get into the Orthodox community. And so what we see over here is that there's a great push to go out and reach the Jews specifically, which leads to the question, why the Jews? Why? Why, why do they care more about the Jews than they do about everybody else? That's not to say that they don't feel a burden for the whole world. They do. 
and they spend billions of dollars on world evangelism. But there's clearly a special emphasis, a special place in their heart for the Jews. And the question is, why? Well, this morning in Shul, we read from the book of Genesis. And what we read in the book of Genesis, and let me remind everybody here, that the first two-thirds of the Christian Bible is the Jewish Bible. And for people who take this Bible seriously, when they read through this Bible, and they read about God's focus on the Jewish people, that automatically um, has an effect on them as readers to recognize that this group of people, the Jewish people, are a special people in God's eyes. So here in Genesis it says, and I will bless, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and those who curse, who, those who curse you I will curse. This is God speaking to Abraham about his descendants. And this, Christians believe, refer to the Jewish people. And so therefore they feel that if they can bring a blessing to the Jewish people by bringing them this good news, then ultimately they will be blessed themselves. But it doesn't stop in the Jewish scriptures. It's true that God calls the Jewish people the apple of his eye. And it's true that God has a great emphasis and a great love for the Jewish people. However, that's not where it stops. You see, for Christians, they continue on into the New Testament. And the New Testament itself is a very Jewish story. What do they read over there? They read about people who lived in the land of Israel. They read about... Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew. All his disciples were Jewish. This took place in Jerusalem, right? And what happened um, when Jesus came and he was preaching, he told his disciples that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This over here is a story about a Canaanite woman who came to Jesus. She had heard that he does many miracles and she had a daughter that was sick and she says, to the, she says to Jesus, please, heal my daughter. And Jesus refuses. Jesus chases her away. And he tells her, I was only sent to the lost house, of the, uh, uh, to, the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so therefore, when, when, when Christians read this, they understand a certain um, degree of importance and preference that Jesus gives to the Jewish people, to his people. And then likewise, we're told that Jesus told his disciples not to go to the Samaritans, but rather he sh they should go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so when the apostles were being sent out throughout the land of Israel to go and spread the message, the message of Jesus, Jesus had sent them first to the Jews. And so Christians understand that the Jewish people have a very special place in God's heart and in the heart of Jesus. And so therefore, that's why they are um, inspired and motivated to go out and to preach to the Jews. But it doesn't stop there. Romans, in the book of Romans, which was written by Paul. So in the first chapter, he speaks about how the power of the gospel, the power of salvation, is something that should go to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. And so you'll find this on many missionary letterheads. You'll find this in many conferences to the Jew first. This is a book written by missionaries basically justifying and trying to help people understand based on their scriptures why it is so important to go to the Jew first. And so this, again, is another um, instruction from their, t from their scriptures, to go to the Jew first. Then there's a special understanding of a particular passage in the, in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, chapter 23, Jesus, who was, again, talking only to Jews, turned to the Jewish people there, and he said to them, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Hashem, blessed are you who come in the name of Hashem. And... What we have over here is a commentary from a messianic leader. His name is David Stern. Um, and, and he writes basically um, that this is a great motivation 
for people to realize that if the Jews aren't accepting Jesus, then he's not coming back. Mm. And so we have to go and reach out to the Jews because that is a prerequisite for the second coming. So again, all these things play into why the Jewish people have become a special focus for Christian missionaries. However, what Christian missionaries have found over 2,000 years is that it's not easy to convert the Jew. Why? Well, Christian groups have been gathering for decades to try and figure out what is it, what's preventing Jews from coming and accepting the, the good news, the gospel. And what they found after spending I don't know how much money and how much time and manpower and effort and research, they came up with two basic problems that stand in the way of Jewish people accepting the message. The first one, which uh, you can see over here <coughs> through the pictures, is the history of Christian, Christian anti-Semitism. The fact of the matter is that Jews suffered terribly at the hands of Christians, whether it was the Crusaders, whether it was the Spanish Inquisition, or whether it was the uh, people being burnt at the stake, pogroms, being called Christ killers. These are all things that Jewish people have as part of their collective memory. And when somebody comes to us and starts preaching to us a Christian message, the first thing we feel is no no thank you we've had enough christian love and uh let's leave it at that and so because they've come to realize that this is a very um tainted past that they have they need to do everything in, the, in their power to change that and let's understand that these groups clearly do not hate jewish people these groups, these people who spend all this time, love the Jewish people. They take all of this very seriously. And so therefore what they decided they need to do is they need to change the narrative. They need to show the Jewish people love. Not just by saying that they love us and that God loves us and that Jesus loves us. And they do say that. But they don't stop there. They put their money where their mouth is. They spend millions of dollars supporting Israel, fighting anti-Semitism, helping Jewish communities around the world. And these Christians are loving Christians and really are motivated from a very genuine and sincere place. And what they have been successful in doing slowly but surely is they've helped the Jewish community to lower their guard to realize that not every Christian is going, to pulp, is going to beat you to a pulp for killing Jesus, right? They don't do that. We understand today that the Christians that we are friends with, neighbors with, or work with us are not the same Christians that were running around in Europe killing our children. We understand that. And so, as a result of this love, they had anticipated that once you remove this barrier, once you remove this um, terrible taste from our mouth, then ultimately we would come running. We would come running into the churches. However, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Why is it not what happened? Well, they had to go do some more research. They had to find out what's the problem. We've spent so much time, so much money, so much effort showing how much we love the Jewish people. What could possibly be in the way? And what they found is, and this is not just true of the Jewish people. This is true of many groups around the world. Many people care a lot about their identity, about who they are, about where they come from. And no one wants to feel that they are leaving and severing 
their roots to join another group. And so if somebody has um, Chinese ancestry, they're not interested in being told, you're no longer Chinese, now you're Canadian. No one wants to hear that you're no longer a Jew, now you're a Christian. I recently heard a story about a girl here in Toronto, a Jewish girl, who the missionaries managed to get her to convert to Christianity and to embrace Jesus. She came to a group setting, and the pastor introduced her and said, here is so-and-so, she's no longer a Jew, now she's a Christian. That alone got her to leave Christianity. She just dropped it right there. Because nobody wants to feel that they are giving up their identity. Our Jewish identity is very much a part of who we are, and no one wants to give that up. And so, what they have realized is they, they need to be able to communicate the gospel, communica- communicate their message in a way that allows for Jewish people to remain Jewish and still embrace their message. And so, what, they, what many missionary groups will do, instead of standing on the street for hours and trying to tell Jews to convert from Judaism to Christianity, they go to Christian churches to teach seminars on how to effectively communicate with Jewish people. They did a recent study, and they found that the majority of Jewish people who have embraced the Christian message did so because a friend told them the gospel. It was a friend that introduced them, not a missionary, not a Christian church. And so, therefore, what they do is they go around and they speak to millions of evangelical Christians and they talk to them, number one, about the importance of sharing their message with their friends and their, and their neighbors and teaching them how to do it. And so what I have over here is um, a clip of a missionary uh, in Australia who was giving practical tips to the audience on what to do and how to be a witness to Jewish friends. So I'll, I'll play this for a minute. It's just a short clip. I want to give you some practical tips on witnessing to a Jewish friend. The first one, of course, is be a friend. The far most uh, effective way of witnessing to a Jewish person is to, d- uh, to develop a true and honest relationship with him or her. But don't befriend a Jewish person merely to get them saved. They will sense that and think that you're trying to use them as a, a trophy uh, of some kind. And uh, let your friendship and love be genuine, and it shouldn't rise and fall on the friend's response to the gospel. You need to be consistent and uh, that's important. The second thing is be a credible witness. As you witness your Jewish friend you need to be a credible witness to the life-changing reality of the Messiah in your own life. This is not so much what you say but how you live as I said earlier. Demonstrating the Messiah lives in and through you. Remember that your life speaks so much more than your words. Now, this is part of a much longer presentation in which he goes through a whole list of things that they should be sensitive about, including what to say and what not to say. In fact, they developed what they call a communications card where, where this communication card tells you about what to say and what not to say. So, for example, don't say Christ Jesus. Why? Because for Jewish people, that, that's irritating. Nobody wants to hear those words. So, speak about the Messiah Yeshua, right? And, 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 and things of this nature. And by doing so, what they hope to do is to make this pill easier to swallow. And so, as a result of this, what they basically do is they repackage Christianity as being something very Jewish. They use Jewish terminology, they use 
Jewish artifacts, the menorah, and so on and so forth. They'll wear a talis, they'll put on a yarmulke, all these things to be able to make this something that Jewish people feel comfortable with. And so, what, what, we ha- what, what ultimately has happened is that over the past 20 to 30 years, these missionary groups have been more successful than they've been over the past 1900 years. Because, let's remember, for most of our history, over the past 2,000 years, the Jewish people have been segregated out of mainstream communities. And therefore, we've kept to ourselves, willfully or not, and we have ultimately been shielded from all the challenges that being emancipated brings with it, all the challenges of assimilation, all these different things that we, we currently are experiencing in in our world. And so what's happening in the world today is that you have millions of Christians who genuinely love Jewish people, they want to open their hearts and homes to Jewish people, and they want to be there where Jewish people need them. So what I'm going to show you now is, uh, this is a guy named Gal Levy. Gal Levy is a guy who I met uh, when I was first joining Jews for Judaism um, about 2005 and 2006. Um, What happened was he is an Israeli young man who had just finished the army, and he went traveling like many Israeli uh, young boys and girls do after the army. They go around, they go to Thailand, they go to Asia, they go to Australia, they go to New Zealand, they go all over the place, and many of them are looking for answers, they're looking for spirituality, they want to find themselves, and many of them end up in ashrams. Um, But, as you can imagine, these travels aren't cheap. And especially if you're looking for accommodation and food, etc. And so what happened is about 14, 15 years ago, maybe a bit longer, there was a guy um, who was um, warmly embraced by a, an evangelical uh, couple. They showed him a lot of hospitality, a lot of kindness, and they ultimately were able to witness to him and they were able to bring him over to a belief in Jesus. And he realized that what they have done for him is something that could be done for so many others. And he started an organization called HIT. HIT is an acronym for Hosting Israeli Travelers. And they have a whole um, system where you sign up, and by signing up, you get the addresses and the information of all these Christian families throughout the islands of New Zealand that are willing to host you for either a nominal fee, $5 a night, or for free. And these Israelis, these Israelis know that these are Christians, and, that they, and they know that some of these Christians may talk to them about their faith in Jesus, but Israelis they don't care. It's like, whatever. Let them say whatever they want. It's a cheaper play accommodation for me. I'll take it. And so what happens, what, happens, what happens then is that a percentage of them ultimately start asking themselves questions. And they ask these host questions. And these hosts, they have for them a Brita Chadasha in Hebrew so that they can read the New Testament in Hebrew. And they start reading the, the Gospels in Hebrew and they start reading about Jewish people in there. And slowly but surely, they're sucked in. And this guy, uh, Gal Levy, um, was baptized in Australia. What happened was after he spent his time in New Zealand and these Christian, uh, these Christian hosts had uh, shared the gospel with him, they connected him with Jesus or Jesus in, uh, in Sydney, became a volunteer there. Ultimately, he was baptized in Bronte Beach over here. And I spent many, many hours with him. I unfortunately was not successful in, uh, in ha- taking him out. And today, he has a whole organization in Israel where he's training other young Israelis to go out and to, uh, and, and to get
get more people to believe in Jesus. So I want to I read something to you today. Um, uh, this, is, this is from an article uh, that, that was written about this hosting Israeli travelers. Um, he says, it, I'm just going to read as follows. It goes like this. There's no better way to show love and support than by inviting people to stay with you. This is especially true with the Jewish people who for 2,000 years have suffered so much hatred and persecution. Omri Jakubovic, founder of the hit hosting Israeli travelers, told Israel Today. This simple act opens so many doors to be able to witness to the Jewish people. As the famous saying goes, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. He goes on to say, the Israeli traveler make use of a hit to save money, but once they've been hosted, they come to love and appreciate the experience they have with our hosts. 90% of the Israelis enjoy 90% of their hosts and vice versa, <laughs> and many stay in close contact for years after. The goal, of course, is to reach these Israelis with the gospel and love of Yeshua Jesus, an opportunity to plant a seed that will hopefully grow in the future. For some, the close encounter with loving Christians causes a more immediate spiritual awakening. Such was the case with Galavi, this guy, who told us that while he had indeed made use of hit for the financial savings, he walked away with something far more valuable. I had a lot of friends who went to New Zealand ahead of me and told me I could save money and make use of these great accommodations, Lavi recounted. They also mentioned that some of the hosts might talk about Jesus and their love for Israel, but not to worry about that. At first, Lavi was traveling with other Israelis and brushed off efforts by the Christian uh, proprietors to share their faith. The big impact happened when I was traveling on my own, he said. I was more open since I didn't have to worry about criticism from fellow Israeli travelers. One family hosted Lavi at a crucial junction in his spiritual journey. I saw the Ten Commandments on their wall and it shocked me. You don't expect that from Gentiles. Even as a secular Jew, it hit me in a sensitive place and made me consider what it means to be Jewish. The family went on to show Lavi how much they love Israel and the Jewish people and how much they love the God of Israel. They provoked me to jealousy. They clearly had something I didn't. This is a very familiar story that happens for many people around the world. And so, what's happening in the world is that while it might not be in the heart of Thornhill or Lawrence and Bathurst in a way that you can readily identify, it's happening one by one. People are being touched by loving, sincere Christians, and these people are being caught by the missionaries. And I have over here um, a, a video of so what people really think is happening with missionaries. And then I'll show you another clip of what's really happening. <laughs> I see a question. Hello there. Good afternoon. What is that for? We are a group of Jews who believe in Jesus. And Jews and Jesus. Yes, after all, Jesus was a Jew, wasn't he? I think your head needs examining. Yes? yes. Why is that? It's all rubbish superstition. But tell you me. You fight the Muslims and the Muslims fight you. All that was something. A stupid man some 20,000 years ago. Let me tell you. Of course, the majority of Jewish people, they don't believe that Jesus is, is who he says he is. Let me say, I'm here to talk about Jesus Christ. You no, see. Jesus Christ was, to, get, to begin with, was a bastard. Are you talking about the same Jesus Christ or a different Jesus Christ? I must be talking because about a different two. one. There are two. One of them was the son of Mary, who was a bastard, illegitimate, and the other one hasn't come. There's many, many people walking around who aren't ready to hear about God. But uh, in that, there are some who are, and they're the people that we're looking to speak to. So many Jewish people think that that's the experience that Jews or Jesus has all the time, and don't worry about them, nobody takes them seriously. That's what we think is really happening, and that's what we think is the extent of what's going on. Every day, more than two million people search the internet for God, for meaning, for hope. 
People in crisis, facing loneliness, addictions, suicide, domestic abuse, divorce, joblessness, hopelessness. I became addicted to internet pornography. Online gambling totally hooked me. So I'm looking for love on the internet. My husband was beating me. I had nowhere to turn. I'm all alone. I have no family, no friends. And when I got home, I had lost my job. And now I'm desperate. I can't get thoughts of suicide out of my mind. I'm searching for anything to fill the emptiness inside. 76 million Americans say they have no one they can confide in. With nowhere to turn, people in astonishing numbers worldwide are turning to the internet, trying to fill the emptiness inside. The internet is becoming the leading battlefront for the hearts and minds of men, women, and young people. We need to be there to meet them at their crossroads when they are most ready to listen. We're harnessing the power of the internet, opening the widest possible door for the spread of the gospel in the 21st century. We're sharing the good news, seeing people come to Jesus, and making disciples on a global scale we never imagined possible. Right now, the destiny of millions of lives for good or for evil will be determined by the moral and spiritual choices made here in the search window of their computer. If we are not there to meet them with the good news in their time of spiritual crisis, who will be? There are 694 million internet users worldwide. Over 5,263,000 of them live in Israel, spending an average of 57.5 hours monthly surfing the World Wide Web. This is more than any other country in the world. How do we reach them? A TV channel, billboard ads, millions of handouts? Or should we meet them where they are, providing relevant content on the internet? A television ad can cost up to $100,000. Billboard campaigns can cost over $10,000. Printing a thousand handouts would be around $1,000. Or by giving a dollar a month, you can become a part of internet-based evangelism that is reaching thousands of Israelis right now. One dollar. That's about the cost of a single cup of coffee. What, we, what you see is that many, many organizations have realized that the, battle, the battleground for people's souls is no longer on the street. It's not in the coffee shop. It's on the internet. And therefore, they've, so to speak, gone underground. You don't see them. But they're on, they're on YouTube. They are there on Facebook. They are on Instagram. They're on Twitter. They're everywhere. They are everywhere, and they are spending millions of dollars to refine their marketing strategies and to be able to find effective ways to communicate to people at their most vulnerable moment. And they're being extremely successful in that area. And we're sitting here, and we're just looking at videos like the one I just showed you of Juice of Jesus standing on the street and thinking, that's not really a problem. It's a huge problem. In fact, over the past week or so, there's been a big buzz on the internet about girls from Satmar who have been baptized. And the, there's videos on it, of it um, online. Uh, um, they, they, they're claiming that there's four girls that, that have been baptized. Um, I've heard numbers much higher. But uh, this, is, this is happening in a very serious way. And a lot of it is due to the influence of the internet or the accessibility that the internet provides. And while um, when I grew up, when I grew up, <laughs> there was no internet. Um, and so the only way to hear it was either if you had a TV or if you met a, a Christian missionary. Now, no, one, no Christian missionary uh, was really coming near us and uh, we didn't have a TV. And so we were very much protected. But today, every kid's got a phone. 
And all they need to do is sit in the bathroom or go somewhere private and just watch it. They don't have to worry about anybody else and they can think about these issues for themselves. It's not a bad thing to think about these issues for yourself, but what's happened is that the missionaries have really produced um, alluring types of ads which people readily identify with and they go running into their arms. Um, I have a special <laughs> announcements for you um, about a mega church called Hillsong. Has anybody here heard of Hill Hillsong? No. Hillsong is a mega church which was started in Australia. And this is a Pentecostal church. And they have about 40,000 people going through their church on a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, this is 95% um, attended by people under the age of 30, okay? This is a hip place for them to go. This is where they go out on a date. This is where they go and socialize. And uh, it's coming to Canada. So what's, ha what's happening over here basically is that we are living in a world where we are part of a Christian society. Um, the fact of the matter is that most kids that go to university and are out there in the workforce are meeting Christians, befriending Christians, and they are making close relationship ties with these Christians. And these Christians will be going out for a social, for a social event at one, of these Hillsong, um, at one of these Hillsong places, and they'll ask their friend to come along. And the Jewish friend will say, oh, it's not for me, but say, no, come along. I have a guy who, con who contacted me in Sydney, told me he goes to Hillsong just for the music. He goes just for the music. It's like a rock concert. Imagine what our synagogues would look like if we had that going on in our synagogue. I mean, our synagogues would be busting at the seams, right? Because ultimately, what they've done is they've taken, um, they've taken the Christian message and they've tried to package it in a way that sells and that sells to the youth. And the youth are loving it. You have people over there that will tell you that they were contemplating suicide. And as a result of them... Um, joining a group like Hillsong, they all of a sudden have no interest in taking their lives. They have friends, they have people asking them how they are, they have people who really care about them, and they're starting to feel the, the love of God inside their heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that really means is that there are individuals that actually care about these kids, that actually show them love and affection and say that they are uh, important and valued. And when they don't show up, someone calls them and tells them, I missed you, where were you, what's going on, Jesus loves you, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and, and this is something which dr dramatically changes people's lives. And then they ultimately um, associate this change with something that God's done in their life and... For many people, that's the path that they choose for the rest of their lives. And so when we look at some of the vulnerabilities um, that, uh, that the Jewish community has and where, um, where and when uh, these things most often creep up, you have, um, first of all, um, we know that the, in the book of Hosea, it says that my nation is destroyed due to a lack of knowledge. And I would venture to say that it's not just the head knowledge that's lacking. I know many people who are very learned. However, they haven't had an experience where they truly feel filled with love for God and filled with a passion for their Yiddishkeit. And so they may know everything, 
but it's an abstract knowledge. And so Hosea, when he says that it's due to a lack of knowledge that my people are destroyed, it's not just the book knowledge, it's also the experience. And what happens is for many Jewish kids growing up in our community, they're told what to do. And very often, they're completely disconnected with what they're being told to do. They don't see the joy in it. They don't see the, the fulfillment in it. And often it's because they don't see the joy in their parents' lives or in the community's lives. It's like, oh, Pesach's coming, and then we've got the rolling of the eyes. And everybody, oh, no. And, and you know, you can imagine what, what, a, what a child feels when he hears and sees this. Um, another big issue, this is a, a very big issue, is the interpersonal challenges within our communities. So, for example, um, if there is a problem in the family setting, meaning with the family uh, relationships and the dynamics that, that happen within a, within a family. Sometimes the father is angry, sometimes he's abusive, sometimes the mother is neglective, and so on. These things have a tremendous impact on the children, and so therefore they'll go running to the first open arm that is willing to embrace them unconditionally. And so this is a big issue um, that, that the Jewish community has a lot to, uh, to, to work on. Um, then the, the, you have crisis and transition. Remember, every child that goes out of school and enters into university, enters into college, that is a transition. They're going from a safe environment where they have friends and family to support them, and now they're going into the big, bar, the big world out there with no one. And so, therefore, that in itself is a crisis. And sometimes they have a breakup with a, with a girlfriend or, or, you know, or they have a loss in their family. This becomes a transition and a crisis point, and Christian missionaries are there to help them. And the people who help you are the people who have your ear. That's the bottom line. You know, what I find in my work is that, you know, at times I'll be called to speak to a Jewish person who has embraced Christianity. And I ask them their story, they tell me their story, and quite often I find that I'm at a disadvantage because this person is viewing me and saying, one second, where were you before I was a problem? <laughs> no one paid any attention to me when I was doing everything right. Nobody paid any attention to me when I wasn't this big quote-unquote problem case, I don't want to talk to you now. I don't want to talk to you now that I've got my life sorted out. Other people came in. Other people helped me out. Too late. You know, too little, too late. And so we have to really make a reckoning within ourselves. Are we going and reaching out to those closest to us, the people that we encounter every day, and making sure that they have what they need, the love that they need, the, the reassurance that they need, giving them the confidence that they need, giving them the praise that they need. All of that stuff is stuff that we need to give them. And then you have the professionalism. Let's just remember for a moment. Christianity has been working on their marketing for 2,000 years. If you had a product that you're trying to sell and you have 2,000 years to work on marketing, you're going to get something right. And they've been working and working and working. And you know what? They're effective. They're effective in their marketing. Their music is, I mean, I've told people, you know, if I wasn't a religious Jew, I would go there just for the music as well, right? And that's just the reality. The music is incredible, right? And, uh, and, and, and then the social environment, just remember, nobody wants to be the odd one out. Nobody wants to stick out like a sore thumb. Everybody's going to this event. I'm not going to go. So these are the challenges that our community have. And ultimately, unless we are going to enrich the experience of our own Yiddishkeit and the experience of the Yiddishkeit of, the, of our kids, then it's not the missionaries that are the problem. It's, 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 our, it's our lack of attention. That is, that is the problem. And so this basically summarizes uh, the presentation for tonight. Um, the question was, are missionaries 
still a problem? And the answer is they are very, very real. They are out there. They're working hard and they're doing it with a commitment and with a dedication that if we had an even small percentage of their dedication to be able to look after our children the way they want to look after our children, I don't think we'd have a problem at all. So um, thank you very much for listening and for coming.